Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. This is going to be another circuit breakdown. This time I have decided to use the community feature on YouTube and I put out a poll and I was asking for input. So uh, thank you very much for those who voted. This was the most voted. Uh, Marshall Plexi was, I think, the response and I decided to take it up another level. And what I'm going to do today is I have taken schematics from the 5F6A Fender Baseman, the JTM45, the Plexi, and the JCM800, and I would like to do a deep dive into these circuits. Uh, these are some of the found most foundational amp circuits, and uh, tracing the lineage is a really kind of fascinating topic. So my intention is to try and identify how the circuit modified and grew and changed through the years. And um, now, in doing research in preparation for this episode, one of the things I stumbled across is sometimes these concepts aren't always actually very clear or specific, meaning the JTM45, for example, actually had multiple different iterations throughout different years. So um, there isn't necessarily one single circuit or schematic. So it, it kind of was evolving even internally. So I'll try to address some of those things. And even like the concept of the plexi is actually a little bit confusing and can refer to maybe a couple of different amps. And so I'm going to do my best to try to bring clarity to that, but also would very much appreciate your input. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Grab a coffee or a, maybe a bagel. Uh, this is going to be a deep dive. So let's hop right in. Let's start with the Fender Basement. Now, um... I am going to go all the way through the whole schematic, and a lot of this will come on the front end with the basement. And then what I have done is I've actually overlaid the changes. JTM45 is here in red, and then from JTM45 to Plexi is here in blue, and then to JCM800 is here in gold. So that's the format I'm using. I think it was easiest for me to understand going that direction. So. Let's start off over here at the input. Now, the basement is fairly famous for having this four input style, which you see also in the JTM45 and the Plexi, but not in the JCM800. And this input style is very interesting for a couple reasons. Basically, what you're doing is you are setting the amp to have two parallel paths. So, for example, uh, you know, you've got this bright channel here on the top, sending circuit and signal in here, and then joins right in here, and then you've got the normal channel sending in here, traveling this way, volume control, and then joining in here. So you have these two parallel inputs, which is a very fascinating and intriguing setup, and one that I've come to really enjoy in amp design. But we'll get a little bit more into it. And the way that this parallel input grew and evolved through the generations is a really interesting part of it. But to focus again on these two input jacks, so let's start up here on the bright and explain what's going on. It's, it's kind of a deceptively complex circuit. So, uh, this number one input, this is kind of our high input. The number one input, there is this tool. You've got your signal coming here on the tip. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to travel here to this junction. It's got one meg to ground that's going to help set the input impedance. And then it can travel through here through 68K, or it can also travel up this way and then go toward the to the tip of the number two input and also travel through this 68K and meet up at this same spot, which basically means that you actually have 34K of resistance. Two 68s in parallel is 34K. And that is your grid stopping resistor, because from here you go to the grid of this first 12AY7 gain stage. And this 34K is a relatively moderate to lowish value. So you end up having a nice, full, strong, high output in, um, input into this first gain stage. One meg is a high input impedance that's very desirable. That means that it can accept a lot of signals from you, whether it's from your guitar, from pedals, it's going to accept them pretty fully. You know, one meg is kind of the optimal or ideal uh, input impedance that you want to see. 
And then these two 33Ks are the grid stopper. You want a little, maybe a little bit of resistance there to help block some of the high like AM radio or FM radio frequencies from getting into your signal. But at the same time, if you get too large of a value, you can actually, you're, you're placing resistance on your signal. So you're going to be slowing that down. You're going to be impeding it a little bit. Uh, so that's your high input. And it's the same thing to hear down on number one. Now let's contrast that with the second input. Okay, our signal comes in here. It sees a 68K resistor, and then at this point, it travels this way, but it also sees 68K here and one meg here going to ground and running a resistor through a resistor and then seeing a second set of resistance to ground. That is a voltage divider, and a voltage divider is a fancy way of describing a volume control. So what you have here is 68K resistance that is also functioning as your grid stopping resistor. So that's higher than the 33K, 34K that we had on input number one. But then you also have what is basically like a preset volume control with the volume turned down. So you're bleeding some of your signal via a preset volume control voltage divider to ground. And so that's why this second input is so much quieter. Now, in my personal opinion, I actually think that this low input really, I mean, maybe if you've got super high output pickups that you want to attenuate, you know, maybe then it can make some sense. But in my opinion, this, this high input is really the way to go, and just simply because you can just as well turn the volume down on your guitar. It's really kind of functioning the same thing and go into the high input and you can achieve pretty much the same result or use your, your pedals. So I guess I would personally rather have that control, but uh, that is kind of a unique quirk uh, to these amps. The next thing I want to talk about is a lot of the time people will uh, jumper the inputs, meaning they may plug into number one, but then they'll jumper two over here to the other side. So you're basically going into both inputs at the same time and what that is does is it, it it gives you access to both of these gain stages which are going to be riding in parallel with one another and you know that's a really interesting way of setting things up you know because number one these two gain stages are going to be in phase with one another and when I'm talking about phase, what I'm referring to is the fact that oftentimes in electronics when you run through certain components your phase is flipped so, for example, if this is your sine wave that's coming from your guitar, you can see the phase goes up positive. If there's a halfway point here, up is positive, down is negative. Well, when you run through a tube, you go into the grid and you exit out the plate, your phase flips. So if this was the input signal, first of all, it's going to be amplified, so it's going to be bigger, but it's also going to have its phase flipped. See how this one goes down and this one goes up? the phase has flipped 90 degrees or 180 degrees. Well, the phase is also flipping down here. So even though you have flipped phase, you've flipped, flipped phase in a mirrored or an equal fashion, and so it works out that you can join up over here. And that's one reason, for example, if you look at the blackface fender setup, they also have four inputs for the normal and vibrato channel. But you don't see guitar players jumpering those because those have an, an unequal amount of gain stages. The vibrato channel has an additional gain stage that's going to flip the phase. So when you join them back together in their mixing channel, uh, it does not work. So just a very interesting tidbit about this. So let's uh, now we run to our, our first gain stage. This is a 12AY7, which is a pretty critical detail. 12AY7 is a lower output, high, lower gain tube than 12AX7, which is more commonplace these days. So it's going to make this amp have a quieter, uh, less gain, less overdrive, less distortion in this preamp phase. Uh, so it's going to really make it more inclined towards kind of the pop country blues scene rather than, the, you know, if you think about Marshalls, one of the reasons why they are more rock oriented, it is because, partly because you got this 12AY7 in V1. Going to give it a little more headroom too. Um, coming in here on the grid, which is standard, and then you're exiting out right here through the plate of the tube. And uh, that is a very straightforward, you know, triode tube amplifier 
gain stage. On the plate, you have this 100K resistor right here that is bringing your B plus voltage, which is coming down this road right here. So that's your high B plus voltage. It's good. It says here about 150 volts. And then your 100K uh, helps to set your load line for your for your uh, plate resistor. And 100K, I, in my in my observation, is probably the most bone stock standard plate resistor value. So um, nothing really extra special about that. And you can see this is actually mirrored on both sides. They both have 100K plate resistors. Then let's also talk about these two cathodes. So this is the cathode of the tube. Interesting in this amp is the cathodes are actually tied together and to a single 120 ohm cathode bias resistor and a 250 microfarad cathode bypass capacitor. This is interesting because when you tie them together, you double the current, which means this 820 ohm resistor basically has to work kind of twice as hard to manage and set the bias for these tubes. And so uh, that basically means that because the current is doubled, it is a, as if each individual one is at 1.6K. And that's interesting because 1.5K for a bias, a cathode bias resistor is again, the bone stock standard value. If 100K is the stock value for a plate resistor, 1.5K would be the stock value for a cathode bias resistor. And that just allows for a very clean output up, you know, it's a clean bias, a neutral bias that the tube is going to basically be able to operate in a pretty linear-ish fashion uh, and, and is, is a good bias. But, but again, they're uniform, meaning both tubes are biased equal to one another. There's no difference at all. And then 250 microfarad is a very, very high value cathode bypass capacitor. Any kind of cathode bypass capacitor is going to increase the gain of this stage by kind of relieving, um, it's some, you know, I think of it as uh, constipation of the tube, as Uncle Doug would call it. And 250 is an extremely high value. And what this serves, if this is your frequency chart, you know, this is 20 hertz, this is 20K, 20 20,000 hertz, and you've got a high pass filter. The value of this capacitor helps to set the breakpoint of this high pass capacitor. And 250 sets this really low. Um, there you can run the math on it, but it's, it's basically well below the operating value that an electric guitar would ever use. You know, if you think about like 100 hertz and below, that's really not an effective range. And I want to say that we're well below that, like 40 or 50. Um, and I, I've, I've used cathode bias, cathode bypass capacitors at about 5 or even 2 microfarad, and it really is about the same. And I think you have to get down below 1 to maybe like 0 0.5, 0 0.05 to get start um, increasing this knee into the 100, 150, 200 hertz range where you're going to start feeling that some lows are going to be trimmed. So this 250 is a very, very full frequency uh, cathode bypass capacitor. Okay, so now we've come through our, let me get rid of all this scribbling. We've come through our first gain stages and we run into these two coupling capacitors. This is going to help, as we mentioned before, we've got our high voltage direct current coming in here. And, you know, it, it's obviously going to the plate, but it still is, is, would look to go this way. And these, ca these capacitors help to block or decouple this gain stage so that the direct current does not continue any further along in the circuit. 0.02 is a relatively standard or, or normalized type of a value for this. You might see like a 0.1 is maybe like a Tweed Deluxe is famous for having 0.1. It's a lot, it's more low end. And you might later in, in other circuits we'll look at and it might be a, like a 0.002 and that's going to again trim base frequencies for a brighter signal. So 0.02 is, is somewhat moderate uh, for electric guitar use and purpose. And again, of note, these are mirrored to one another. So everything up to this point has been completely the same. We run into 
our volume controls, our voltage dividers. One meg, one meg. Now here's where we see the only difference that you will find amongst these two parallel gain stages is right here. This is a uh, basically like a treble bleed capacitor. So if you think of your signal, it's been comes in from the grid, it's been amplified, passes through the the uh, bypass cap, and it reaches this voltage divider. And this is going to look at your signal. It's going to bleed some of it to ground and some of it moving on forward. But if the volume control is somewhere below maximum, then the very high frequencies are going to be allowed to pass through this capacitor more easily. And they are not going to be attenuated by this volume control. And so the lower that you turn down the bright volume, the brighter the signal is going to be. Because again, this volume control is, is going to be more effective on mid-range and base frequencies. And a 0 0.0001 is a very low value. I think we're looking at like 100 picofarad, um, 100.0001 megafarad. And so very high frequencies are going to be allowed to p pass freely around the volume control, while the mid-range and base frequencies are going to be attenuated. Now, if you have the volume cranked, this thing isn't going to do anything because you know the whole the whole signal is passing through unimpeded, no matter what. So, and then on this normal side, there is no capacitor here to pa pass those highs. Then you run into these two 270k mixing resistors, and that is going to help. Um, you know, you you have this junction point where you have two signals that are joining with one another. And, you know, that could create a problem where, you know, the signal coming from here could choose to go back up this direction. And that would not be good. So by putting a resistor here, it's going to be more inclined to go this way. And same thing, the signal coming this direction is going to want to go this way because it's going to see this resistor. So, again, the only difference between these two parallel gain stages is this, this capacitor right here. And so kind of a hallmark of, of, the, of the basement is just how similar these two parallel input stages are. Next we come to our second gain stage. This is a 12A X7, so higher gain tube. Of note here, we've got 100K. This is our, remember this is our DC line feeding our first tube. Well here's that same line feeding our second tube. And um, actually, get rid of that. it's gonna come up here through this 100K resistor, same as what we saw over here, feeding into the plate of this tube. And then you have on the cathode, you've got the 820 ohm cathode bias resistor. Now remember, same that we saw over here, but this we had two cathodes that were tied together. This is just one. And so this really is an 820 ohm bias resistor. There is no bypass cap whatsoever here. So it's going to be a lower gain than what potentially could be if you wanted to add cathode bypass capacitor here that would increase the gain of the stage and that's a mod that you could consider but the 820 ohm is going to result in a warmer bias compared to the 1.6k which is more of a neutral bias and uh, so definitely a hallmark of this second gain stage no bypass cap and more of a warmer bias now this is very interesting because you exit the plate you enter the straight into the grid of the other side of this triode. And instead of exiting through the plate, if you go, here's our plate, and there is nowhere for the signal to go. You can go down here and see a bunch of DC, or you can go up here, I mean, go back. I mean, there, but there's that's not, you're seeing 100K resistance there, so you don't want to do that. So the, the plate here is not the exit point of the signal. Instead, the signal is going to exit here through the cathode and this is called a cathode follower and what is really of note here is a cathode follower does not increase the gain so it doesn't amplify the signal the amplification is basically you know just what it was coming in but what it does is it lowers the impedance of the signal and that is really useful to drive, you know, we talk about impedance when we're driving long cable runs. If you think about a buffer on your pedal board or on a, um, like a DI box that's going to go to front of house, you want a low impedance to drive that long 
cable run, right? A lower impedance is much better at driving a signal. Well, we've coming up next is our tone stack. And so having a low impedance means that the signal will drive through the tone stack more efficiently with less insertion loss than if it were to exit through the plate. So uh, that's a really big advantage and cool part of this circuit is you've got this very unique setup here. Um, you know, this cathode follower is, is a huge hallmark of this circuit. And, and, and again, we've already talked about one gain stage, another gain stage in parallel. Here's gain stage number two. And then we got this cathode follower. And now we come into our tone stack. So this tone stack is quite late in the preamp, you know, compared to like the blackface style amp where the tone stack is going to be in here. Uh, the tone stack is quite late in the preamp. And that is of particular note here. You know, a lot of the... Uh, shaping of the signal, the character of the distortion is done with some of these other values, right? These plate resistors and these these cathode bias resistors and these coupling caps, those have really done the tone shaping so far. But this is really the first point in the circuit where we get some power to really shape the tone. And because it's later in the preamp, it's really just acting as a pure EQ to shape the kind of the end of the preamp stage here. So uh, this is our classic Fender FMV, Fender Marshall Vox, three-band tone stack. This is basically just a series of passive filters. You have RCs, resistor capacitor, which are uh, low or high-pass filters. They're going to filter out lows. And you also have CR filters, which are going to filter out treble and are going to pass lows, so low-pass. And uh, they're basically three of those filters stacked together. And the bass and the middle are, base, are the same type of high-pass filter, uh, just with a different value. And so basically what happens is whatever doesn't cut it at the bass, really what's left over is the mid-range. So uh, it's kind of interesting how this works. Now, like I said, there's going to be insertion loss here, meaning the level of the signal is going to be decreased. And you're just going to have that anytime you have a tone stack. But because it has got this cathode follower that has lowered the impedance, it's going to do a little bit better there. Now, I would say these values that you're using in the tone stack are all quite critical for shaping the sound of the amp. You know, this 56K slope resistor is going to dictate these two filters here, where the bass and mid filters kind of come into play. These, these caps as well, very critical. Uh, this capacitor here, in, in combination with your 250k treble pot, uh, set the the treble frequency side of this, and all of you can you can change all of these and have a pretty strong effect on it. And if you want to look more into tone stacks, check out the Duncan Tone Stack Calculator. I recommend you download that, and you can play around with it. This is this is the Marshall style, and I think of particular note is first of all you got a 250k mid-range pot, which is pretty high. Whereas the blackface fender is going to be more at 8.2k, I believe. Or is it 6. Point, I think I'm sorry, 8.2k is the fuzz phase. 6.8k uh, is is the resistor value for blackface. So having a higher mid-range resistance here means you have a lot more mids that are capable or available on the mid-range sweep. Um, <clears throat> but overall, a very effective tone stack. And really, we won't see tremendous changes throughout the years on this. So we exit through the treble control. You'll note in this part, there is no master volume. This is the end of the preamp, and this is where your master volume would have to be. And if you wanted to put one in you here, you could, but uh, there's no master volume. This is a non-master volume amp. So the only control over volume you've got is way over here on the, after this first gain stage. So uh, there is no other further attenuation available to you other than this first preamp volume. So, so definitely um, a characteristic of this amp. Next, we run into this area, which is our long tail pair phase inverter. It takes up a whole triode with two gain stages. Signal comes in here, enters into the grid of our first uh, pair, and then it's going to travel through here to our second pair. we got some of these other components here as well to help uh, set everything up correctly, including our cathode, our ground. Um, and overall, this is, uh, we've got some D DC coupling here as well. You know, overall, a very um, 
very, very popular. The long tail pair phase inverter is a very, very iconic phase inverter, primarily because of its use in this amp. And I would say this is this is an opinion that I have, but a lot of people really get excited about the the Marshall Plexi and its its power amp distortion. You turn up the volume and you your bones shake because of the power amp distortion. And I think that's a little bit of a misnomer because I actually think that that sound is just as much due to what's going on here at the long tail pair than anywhere else. Because again, we've got no attenuation here. So you turn up this first volume control way up, you've got one, two, and then the long tail pair actually adds a third gain stage because these, these, these are both coming into the grid and exiting through the plate. So you've, even though you're getting phase inversion, you are amplifying the signal with three gain stages. And so I think just as much of the that crunchy power amp distortion tone is the result of the phase inverter clipping and being pushed into distortion by these prior gain stages as much as it is the two power tubes. So long tail pair, high gain uh, amplification section. One kind of quirky thing about the long tail pair that's quite fascinating to me is that you have these plate resistors. So again, our DC line is down here. It's coming up this way and then here. One goes this way, this is 100K to our plate, and the other one goes here, this is 82K to the plate. Different. And, and that is just kind of a quirk of the long tail pair. And basically what's happening is because the, the way that it works, you need to unbalance them. Otherwise, it won't work very well. Um, there's a more technical explanation. If you want to check that out, go to Uncle Doug's channel and his explanation of the long tail pair. But just kind of a quirky part of the schematic. Uh, but that's just due to the nature of the long tail pair phase inverter. I also want to note that right here, is the this is our negative feedback line so this is coming over here the output transformer these are our speakers there is a tap off this output transformer through this 27k resistor to here and this is the insertion point of our negative feedback and we'll come back to that but just remember that and here's our presence control too so we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute but uh, just remember this is our insertion point okay so now we're leaving our long tail pair phase inverter and remember, here we've got our, our sine wave. We only have one of them. And now we split it into two. And we've got one up right here doing that. And then we've got another one over here that is inverted. Again, the phase is inverted. Right? This one's going up, this one's going down. And that's pretty critical that once they get to the speaker, because we've got a push pull configuration, we need to be pushing. One needs to be pushing and the other one needs to be pulling. That's exactly what this is referring to in order for this amplifier to work in its push-pull configuration. You want to think about like a, like, the, like if you have two ox that are kind of joined together uh, pulling a, a wagon, they need to be working in concert with one another. And so that's what, what this, this phase inverter accomplishes for us in the push-pull. Uh, we come here again to another coupling capacitor. Point one is, is again, going to want a little more bass frequencies rather than the 0.02 that we saw elsewhere. We've got our some 220k resistors here that are again uh, filtering the uh, some direct current that's coming from right here and this is our bias control. We'll get to that in a little bit but remember this is kind of the insertion point for that bias and then we get to our two power tubes. These are 5881s now, often referred to as 6L6s. Now, 5881 is actually a different tube than when, if you would go and try to buy a 6L6 right now, you would probably end up getting a 6L6GC, which is a higher wattage tube than a 5881, actually by a fair bit, uh, but kind of the same hallmark. I would say these 5881s are actually more closely related to like a JJ6V6, which is kind of a, in between a, a traditional 6 6 and a 6 L6 GC. But definitely a noteworthy element of the basement design is the use of the 5881 output tubes. Now, one thing I will also say, though, and we'll talk more about the output tubes later, but 
a lot of people focus a lot on the tube, you know, that a, that a 6L6 is an American sound, whereas an EL34 is a British sound. And again, in my opinion, I think that point is a little bit overstated. And what I mean by that is, I, my personal opinion is if you take everything in this amp we've gone up through so far, this is a basement, this is an American amp, and if you were to run it into a 4x12 with greenbacks, that thing is going to sound like a Marshall. It's going to sound like a Plexi. And the circuit is king. If you go to Millstap, he's a guy who has a YouTube channel, there's a lot of Hendrix stuff, he plays a basement. It sounds just like Hendrix because the circuit is I- almost identical. And and even though it's got 6L6s and not EL34s, I think this the circuit is king. And the, and and the tubes are they do have differences. So I'm not saying they're the same. They have differences. They will each contribute a little bit of a different sound. But I think in my opinion this circuit is king. And when I say circuit, I'm referring to all these values, these resistors, these uh, capacitors, the tone stack, those I think are the most fundamental sh- tone shaping things that you have than the than the output tubes. So um, these these one noteworthy element of this is the cathodes here are tied together and grounded. Uh, you can, if you want, include a some one one ohm resistors on each side, and that helps to bias a little bit easier because then you can. Use your multimeter, read it for voltage, and due to Ohm's law, if, if you use if you have one ohm of resistance, that your current is is exactly what you read there. Uh, it, so so just a little trick you can do is just put uh, one ohm resistors, and then whatever voltage that you read at this point from here to ground is your current. Uh, but the the main idea here though is that you are your cathodes are tied off and they run straight to ground. And instead, you have a bias voltage that is coming in from this part of the circuit that is being inserted here at the grid. Okay, we've got these 470 ohm screen resistors. Nothing really a particular of note. And we get to these output transformers. And then at this point, on uh, the output transformer, I think we come to one of the most, another critical point of tone shaping to, to talk about that it's going to differentiate between these amps. So first of all, the output transformer here is a 2 ohm tap. And I believe that is because we have four 8 ohm Jensen speakers in parallel, which divides down to 2. 8 ohms divided by 4 is 2. And so you're tapping off that 2 ohm with 27k negative feedback. And the interaction here between 2 ohms with 27k negative feedback resistor that sets the amount of negative feedback and that is a critical tone shaping tool for the amp and you know this is a more of a modest amount of negative feedback now negative feedback works backwards um, because what happens is the if you send all of the signal back it's going to cancel and you're basically going to have nothing you know anything that you feed back into itself it cancels. So if you put some resistance in here, the higher this number goes up, the lower the negative feedback is, which means the higher the signal is going this way. So that's going to result in more output, more distortion, a more raw signal. But if you have a lower resistor, you have more signal feeding back, which means that less is pushing this way out to the speaker. You're going to have less distortion, it's going to be cleaner, and you're also going to have more of a flattened frequency response as opposed to more of a mid-peak raw frequency uh, output. So the negative feedback is a very critical point in tuning the amp in a, in a point of differentiation from the circuits that will come next. The other thing I want to mention is we've got this presence control. Not a lot of people seem to really understand what is presence how does it differentiate from treble? Very good question. So the main difference is that with presence, again, we are working within the negative feedback loop. So presence is going to affect treble frequencies, correct. But it does so by forming a 
high pass filter, which is the same type of filter that we see here with our base control. Because again, you have a resistor right here and then a capacitor second. So this is like a base control where the base frequencies are gonna be filtered out and sent to ground. But that means that they are not in the negative feedback loop. So that means there are more base frequencies that are gonna let through, whereas more of the trouble frequencies are gonna feed back. So it's, it's backwards, but it's basically putting a base control in your negative feedback loop. And the difference here is that while treble is more of a passive control, sending highs to ground, um, think of it in opposite, that, that presence is allowing more treble to boost through. So by increasing treble, you're not just, it's different, it's kind of like two ways of saying the same thing, right? Treble, um, treble will cut highs, presence will boost lows. And it kind of accomplishes the same thing, right, With which, which is a brighter signal, but it does so in a little bit of a different way. So I like having a presence control in the amp. Some guys also put like a body control, which would basically be like taking a treble, which is, would be a capacitor and then a resistor, and sticking it in here as well. And that is certainly something you could do, but uh, not don't see in this amp. So that is everything in the main audio path. Let's touch briefly, well, hopefully, I know this is going to get lengthy, but briefly on the power supply. Power supply was designed to see 117 volts AC, which is fascinating, because currently, if you you, you know do an AC measurement of your the voltage coming out of your wall, do so safely, it's probably going to be 120, 123, 125 volts of alternating current, and that's going to get multiplied through your power transformer, and that's going to result in a pretty hot amp which is fascinating because that's a meaningful difference. I mean, your beat plus, by the time you send this 125 volts AC through this power transformer, it's going to, and it's not going to be 325, it's going to be 350, 340, 350 volts AC. It's going to get rectified, and it's not going to be 432 volts DC going to your output tubes. It's going to be 450, 460. So uh, just an interesting note there is, is voltage creep. Um, you do have the of note this ground switch, which I think some have referred to as the death capacitor. Uh, I just recommend that you get rid of this sucker, but um, it is what basically the reason why it is bad is if it's in line, if this capacitor fails, you are sending your 123 volts onto the chassis because this ground is chassis ground, and your chassis ground and your amp is also your guitar strings. Right? Your guitar strings are grounded through the bridge, through the cable, into the amp. And so uh, that's where the danger comes into place. If this capacitor fails, you could have 123 volts live on your guitar strings. So I just recommend you lift and take that out. Um, other thing of note is you do want to also um, probably have the three-prong cord here for safety. But then uh, we got our fuse, three-amp fuse, run into our power transformer. Power transformer, um, we've got our uh, six volt winding here, which is gonna go to the filaments of our GZ34 rectifier tube. Pretty good, high functioning rectifier tube. We've got our 6.3 volt filament windings right here that are going to the heaters of all the tubes and of the pilot light. And then we've got our, this is our high tension, our HT, our B plus. Uh, so this is gonna send our high voltage been, that's been or been power transformed up. Now we do have a tap coming here, and this is going to give us our bias. Now we've got this diode here, which is going to only allow half the waveforms to pass. We've got a filtering cap here. We've got a little bit of resistance here, and then another filter cap. I think this is going to form a little bit of a voltage divider, I believe. And then that's going to send our negative 48 volts. And this is really how you bias these tubes, is with these components right in here. And so one kind of good potential mod to do is to change this to a fixed resistor in line with a pot to ground. So then you have adjustable fixed bias. Um, but overall, a very solid way to do it. The alternative would be a cathode bias, which means you would not have this here 
and you'd have resistors here and potentially a, a cathode bypass cap. And the value of those resistors is what biases your power tubes. But, you know, those end up having to be pretty beefy resistors to handle that. But, again, here we have fixed bias. Run here to our standby switch. Now, I'll refer you to Merlin Blenko's article on standby switches. I'm of the opinion that they are not useful and do not provide much benefit, but uh, that's a little bit of beyond my education understanding, but I just refer to Merlin because he's a pretty smart dude and I believe what he says. Then we run here. So this is our rectified direct current that has left our rectifier tube, but it's pretty raw still, meaning, you know, AC looks like this. That's, that's right here, alternating current. Still have AC right here, and then here is where we should have our direct current, but you still have little bits of this ripple left over because it's not 100% efficient yet. So you have these filter capacitors here, here, two 20 microfarad caps in parallel, in, I believe in, in parallel with one another to ground. And in parallel, I believe that's going to cut the value in half down to 10, which is a relatively low value. In general, the higher value filter caps that you have, that means more filtering. So 10 UF is not a particularly high amount. I want to say with a tube rectifier, you have some limitations. You could get up to 30 or even potentially 40, but I don't. And I, depending on the rectifier, you don't really want to get much beyond that. But if you're using diodes, you can you can go a lot higher. You know, 40, 50, even up to 100. You might see sometimes. So just of note. But um, these two filter caps here, then this is our node. That's going to go to our output transformer, which is going to feed the plates of our tubes, our output tubes. So that's the highest B plus uh, voltage. Next, you run into this. This is a choke, 20 Henry choke. Now, chokes are interesting because they still allow you to filter because you, you need um, a resistor and a capacitor to form that high pass filter to get rid of very, very low frequencies as well as you need some decoupling between each stage so that uh, you can actually get the, the benefit of the capacitor to store that electricity and to get the ripple, get rid of the ripple. But the main difference between a choke and a resistor is that the choke does not produce a bunch of voltage loss. So what I mean by that is if you look here, you see 432 volts prior to the choke and 430 volts after the choke. So there's been only two volts that have been lost. Whereas, um, you know, and this is going to feed the, the screens of our power tubes. But then if you continue this way, we have a 4.7K resistor. And this is going to step down our B plus voltage to 385. So we've gone from 430 to 385 because of this resistor. Now that may be desirable and the app is designed, right, because we're going to feed 12AX7s next. We end up having 235 and 230 volts here at our at our phase inverter but you this is inefficient from an energy perspective that you are losing voltage and that's the interesting point about the choke is you don't have to lose as much voltage so again we've got a 20 two couple of 20 microfarad by uh, filter caps 10k step down resistor and then an 8 microfarad filter cap here. So overall, the this filtering step-down network is not the most robust. These capacitors are relatively uh, conservative, but in the end, we are getting um, pretty healthy voltage. You know, we got this, this node here is feeding all of our 12AX7s, which go through the plate resistors to give us, you know, we got 128 volts here, 150 volts here. Uh, so overall, 150 volts on the plates is is not super high. And and some of that is due to what we started with, 325 volts AC from the power transformer is a little lower voltage than what we will see in some of our other amps. Um, but you know that 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 is one of the highlight, you know, a lower voltage is going to result in a little bit more distortion whereas a higher voltage tends to give you a little more higher headroom and a little bit more clean. But um, just definitely one of the more uh, steadfast parts of our, of our amp design here that we'll see. So that is the basement. Uh, 
an overall an iconic amp. So now let's layer on the JTM45 and see what changed coming next. 